All right, folks, let's talk about democracy for a little while. Hopefully most of the reading was straightforward, um, but I want to put things in context a little bit. The reason we're talking about democracy is not because um, it's the only kind of political organization out there, or because it's necessarily the best, but rather because it forms the context for most of the other thinkers we're going to look at. For better or worse, a lot of the writing on political philosophy that we're looking at is from um, the Western world, primarily from Europe, the US, and, uh, and Canada, where some form of industrialized representative democracy has held sway. So a lot of the writers we're going to look at take it as a given that we're talking about um, how you do policy in a democracy specifically, that the background commitment is to democracy. And you can see this even in things like uh, the Applebaum that we talked about last time. Part of what drives Applebaum's idea that you might have obligations to your role is precisely the idea that this is what's required by a bureaucratic democracy, that the decisions that the people get to make at the top level filter down in a relatively pure form through bureaucrats who mostly do what they're told. A king, for instance, would not face the same kind of concerns about roles. So, in order for any of this to make any sense though, we need to talk about what exactly we mean by democracy and why it is that it has become such a dominant framework for thinking about political morality. So, uh, big issues we're going to cover in the next uh, next little while. First, what is democracy? This might seem obvious. Hopefully I will make it confusing, terrifying, and not obvious by the time I'm done. Um, why is democracy good? Why have so many theorists thought that democracy is the best or possibly even the only acceptable way to organize a political community. And as part of that, um, we need to think about well, what, it, what what's supposed to be good about it? How exactly is democracy supposed to be helping us? And we need to deal with two potentially large objections uh, to democracy, which is what you might think of as sort of the elitist objection, the concern that all of us, me, professor of public policy, you budding or existing public policy experts, smart people all, why is it that in a democracy our opinions count only as much as imagine whatever group of people you think have really stupid and uninformed opinions? Um, and the other is the tyranny of the majority issue, which is very closely related, but doesn't have to do with any presumption of ignorance or stupidity, just has to do with the, the question of why should what most people want get to be so important as it is in a democracy. Even if we're talking about a majority that is well informed, it might be a well informed and completely venal and self interested majority. The majority of people in the United States are not homosexual. So there might be a concern about, well, why should we have a system where we constantly have to be making excuses for a anti-majoritarian protection for something like homosexuality, if you are inclined to do so, of course. Um, why not just have a system that doesn't place so much weight on majorities? And finally, one thing we should at least keep in the back of our head, though it will not be one of the major themes, is the question of, is there a right to democracy? There are lots of folks who talk about, dem to, who consider democracy to be the only morally acceptable way of organizing a polity organizing a political community. And the two questions that really come up here are, are they correct? You know, is it wrong in some sense for people to live under a non-democratic regime? And secondly, even if they're correct, it's the only acceptable one, is it a right for everyone right now to have a democracy imposed? Are there barriers, not necessarily imposed from the outside, but to have a democracy created? Or are there barriers to the development and stability of a democracy that explain the moral acceptability of some nations not being democratic, even if you buy the idea that ideally everyone would be?
Okay, so let's talk about democracy. And the way that I would like to set the stage for thinking about what democracy is, is by talking about sort of the upper and lower extremes of the definition. The problem is that when we say democracy, most of us have a general idea what we're talking about. But there's a tremendous amount of variation in democracies. Ancient Athenian democracy and contemporary American democracy look very different as systems, both the context and the system itself. Contemporary American democracy and contemporary British democracy or contemporary Ghanaian democracy or contemporary Egyptian democracy, right? The differences may be less drastic, but they are nonetheless significant. And uh, most of you probably know, there are all sorts of arguments about whether or not certain political organizations, certain countries' political regimes are democratic in name only, whether they sort of fall off the map of democracy even though they have some of the forms, or even if they consider themselves a democracy. So for instance, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the official name of North Korea is the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea. We can argue about it, and there's a reason why they call it democratic, but at the very least, what's meant by democratic there is very different from what most Americans or Europeans would understand by democratic, right? Um, it doesn't meet the conditions that we would normally consider to be requirements of, demo of, of democracy, at least in our political tradition. So before we talk about whether, whether or not democracy is good and why it's good, we need to get a little bit of a handle on what exactly we mean when we say democracy. What are we asserting? the ancient Athenians and the contemporary United States and contemporary Mexico and 19th century America have in common <clears throat> that uh, does not apply to, you know, early 2000s Zimbabwe or um, Iraq under Saddam Hussein or North Korea currently, even though they might call themselves democracies, they might have elections, that sort of thing. So on one end of the scale, there are what we might call minimalist definitions of democracy. Minimalists typically want to focus on um, only a few core elements of democracy. And the, the big one is reasonably fair periodic elections with genuine competition. A lot of minimalists, as part of this definition, basically analogize democracy to a market. Schumpeter, who I mentioned at the bottom of the slide, is one of the, the big defenders of minimalism, explicitly analogizes democracy to a market. The idea is as long as there's f basically fair competition for votes, more or less nothing else matters. Minimalists are going to say, yeah, look, Lots of respect for human rights, um, equity and distribution of things, the ability of people to um, deliberate freely and publicly about the kinds of, um, you know, the, the kinds of political outcomes they want. That might be nice, right? You can have that if you want it, but that's not core to, um, that's not core to the notion of democracy. All you need for democracy is the ability for people to choose freely among proffered candidates and have some sort of fairness in, in, in that competition, right? The, so they leave out things like Iraq under Saddam Hussein because they say, well, look, that was rigged. There weren't really any other, any other competition. That's like a monopoly situation. So not democratic. But as long as you have fair competition, you're basically democratic. Now, there are some drawbacks to understanding democracy this way. Uh, mostly normative drawbacks. One of the advantages that's often claimed for this kind of definition is that it's pretty analytically clear and decisive. If we don't care whether democracy is a good thing, right? If we don't want a definition of democracy that explains why it's good, this can be a very uh, attractive descriptive definition of democracy. 
And in fact, a lot of defenders of this kind of definition um, is basically the kind of definition Fareed Zakaria used in his famous book, um, uh, Future of Freedom, I want to be very careful and very clear that they are not using democracy in a kind of honorific sense, in a sense where it implies that whatever you have is good. But there are other writers who want to say, no, this is in fact, this gets you what we should morally reasonably want out of a system. Anything else is sort of gravy and it might not even be good or it might be good for only some, some people. So the normative drawbacks, the things that, that, that make people worry about these kinds of definitions are that it's perfectly compatible with elite control. Right, so the kind of thing that Ralph Nader or Ron Paul or you know pick your favorite, not from the mainstream two parties in America folks complain about, is perfectly acceptable to the minimalists. The minimalists are going to say, yeah, look, you know, actually, um, it doesn't matter how close Barack Obama and Mitt Romney are on the issues. All that matters is you have a free and fair choice between them. And you can think of this as explained by their by their analogy to the market, right? A lot of them would say, look, if, you know, Posner certainly would say, look, if there was a real demand for a libertarian candidate, more people would vote for Ron Paul. The fact that he didn't win in the marketplace of votes is meaningless, right? Too bad for him. Either more people would vote for him, or people would force Mitt Romney to be more Ron Paul-like. There are some structural reasons why third parties have problems in the United States. But it's not a big problem. And in fact, um, some people might take this to be an evidence of the robustness of something like the American system. Right? They would say, well, basically, the closeness of the two parties is showing that the government is basically giving Americans what they want. We voted with our, with our votes. Actually, we've said we want something that's basically in this neighborhood. Anyone who deviates too far from that, eh, we're not interested, right? It's like saying, it would be like saying, look, what's the problem? Coke and Pepsi, sure, they taste pretty much the same. But, you know, there's a reason why they taste pretty much the same. If they taste one tasted very different, people would stop buying it. So stop complaining. <clears throat> At least in some formulations, um, Minimalism allows for limited franchise. Schumpeter, for instance, was willing to say that uh, it didn't matter how restricted the pool of voters that you had, you could still call it a democracy. So, for instance, um, the early United States, where women, propertyless white men, and non-whites typically could not vote, um, would count as democratic, by at least Schumpeter's definition. Um, and of course, there's room for all sorts of other sorts of things, civil liberties restrictions, right? You can be a, on this definition, you can be a democracy even if there's state-owned media or censorship or this sort of thing, as long as it doesn't undermine fair competition. There are some advantages, though. Like I, meant, like I said, simple definition, good for analytic purposes. Um, if you want to talk descriptively about democracies rather than normatively, this can be a really useful definition to have in your back pocket. Um, Posner is big on the idea that it requires very little of citizens. Um, it's similar to going to buy stuff in a store. Again, back to the market metaphor. Yeah, if you want to, and maybe if it's a really big purchase or something, you might do a lot of research. But, you know, most of the time you won't. You go to the store, you pick the thing that looks the best, and, uh, you know, you end up with Coke or Pepsi. You're not going to die either way. Uh, you're going to basically get some cola and you will be more or less happy. And so most of the time, you don't have to worry too much about what you're buying at the store, only if it's a really big deal. Posner thinks, look, that's what most people want out of their government. Mostly they want the government to be out of the way, in the background, you know, making sure stuff runs smoothly, making sure we don't get attacked. Um, but they don't want to worry about the details of bank bailouts or foreign policy or redistributive policy or tax policy. They mostly want that just to kind of run on its own and not have to worry about it. And minimalist democracies might have a normative advantage in allowing for that, allowing for people to basically not care. All right. On the other hand, you have maximalist definitions. Um, maximalists, sometimes uh, you'll see this branded as deliberative democracy or participatory democracy. There are some subtle distinctions theorists make, but all in that category. They think to be a democracy, 
properly speaking, yeah, you need elections, free and fair elections, free and fair competition, but also extensive institutional support for equitable and citizen input. So things like making sure that you actively encourage public dis discussion of the issues, making sure that you include as many possible voices, right, especially for many deliberative Democrats from marginalized groups, right? So if a group is a minority, if it is despised, if it is, um, you know, otherwise marginalized from mainstream society, you want to make extra effort to go out and bring those people into the discussion. And citizenship comes with fairly heavy obligations. As a citizen, you are expected to be an active participant in the process of running the government. Um, and the, if the model for the minimalists is something like a market, a competitive market, the model for the maximalists is something like a large-scale cooperative project. We're all in this together. Um, government is something is not just a regulator that keeps running in the back of our lives. Government is something that we should all be part of and making the public good as a group. Um, and deliberative Democrats worry a lot about how to forge a various large divided society into some sort of cooperative project. Right? You can see this in the Iris Marian Young discussion of how you turn differences from a kind of divisive identity politics that might be fine for a minimalist into a spur to better cooperation, better mutual understanding, and that sort of thing. So, normative advantages of this. It's inclusive by design. It's egalitarian, again, typically by design. Um, a lot of deliberative Democrats are very concerned with things like money in politics or other kinds of influence that will get your ideas heard out of proportion to their value as ideas. And ideally, it promotes a kind of deep compromise. The minimalists are happy with a system that allows the majority of people to win, the majority of people to get what they want. That allows the system to at least avoid making really huge mistakes. You know, you, minimalism avoids the new coke of politics. Um, but deliberate Democrats want something more. They want people to not just say, well, all right, my view won this time, your view will win next time, or vice versa, so we'll just wait for the next fight. Because they see this as basically a large-scale cooperation, they want to find ways to say, all right, what's good about your view, and what's good about my view? Let's sit down, figure this out, and come up with something new that we don't just go along with because someone won the, won the Democratic fight fair and square, but we go along with because we've now actually found what, what we really think is the best solution, a sort of deep compromise, not just a log-rolling compromise. Disadvantages, uh, again, fairly, fairly obvious one is it's extremely demanding of institutions and individuals. Uh, no actual democracy lives up to this. Um, if it did, it would take a lot of your time up. So it's the anti-Posner view. You would be, this is the one where you're at community meetings all the time. Um, if any of you have been involved with any sort of grassroots organization, you can see why this might be a problem. Uh, I've sat at meetings where we spent two hours trying to figure out how we were going to decide what we were going to do. So not even deciding what we we're going to do, deciding the procedure by which we would decide what to do. Um, so yeah, uh, that's not for everyone any of the time, and even people who really are into that stuff, you know, even if you've been to every single meeting of your local Occupy Wall Street, probably occasionally you need a break from it. This would be your life under an ideal deliberative democracy. It would be very, being a citizen would be a big deal, take a lot of your time. Possibly a little bit less obvious, um, and certainly in tension with the intent of the view, is there concern, there's a concern that it might actually end up being elitist, despite itself. We can get into this more in discussion if folks want the details, but the basic idea is that deliberative democracy, by requiring that citizens come together in certain ways, you know, we come together not just to yell at each other, not just to um, fight, but we come together to deliberate together, to try to come up with a new political idea. Um, that's actually hard 
for a lot of people. It can be practically hard. Again, you know, you might be the sort of person for whom going to an activist meeting is not your cup of tea, but you can do it if you want to, right? Someone who is poorer, who might be working many more hours than you, may just not have the time and energy to do it. It can be exclusionary also in terms of the discursive skills that are required. So many deliberative Democrats talk as if all it requires to deliberate is to be reasonable and willing to sit down with other people. And they often don't take into account the way in which doing this at all, and certainly doing it well, are learned skills. And they're skills that are typically possessed primarily by the elites in society. Deliberative Democrats who are philosophers, they want this to work like everybody was in a philosophy department, and they don't always take into account the fact that, um, you know, not everyone has studied formal logic. It takes a certain amount of restraint to keep your emotions in check. It might even be unreasonable restraint if something's very emotional, right? Uh, if I'm talking very calmly about cutting off support for medical treatment that your family member needs to live, maybe it's unreasonable for me to say, whoa, look, let's just calm down and discuss this abstractly, right? So these are the sorts of concerns that are there. Uh, if you're interested, actually, I think Fung is one of the people who's best on not doing this. Um, but it's a concern and something that deliberative Democrats at least should look out for. Okay. Let's see why my slide will not change. There we go. So, in the middle, and just for the sake of having something to talk about that I think is a decent compromise between these two views, um, in the middle is what Dahl calls polyarchy. This is not a timeless understanding of democracy. This is an understanding of basically what a lightly idealized form of modern industrial representative democracy would look like. And the reason to think about this, not just that Dahl defends it and thinks that it gets most of the good things out of democracy, is just that I think this is actually the kind of idea that many of the writers we look at are going to have in the back of their minds. Democracy in the sense of Dahl's polyarchy is to some extent a normative term. It's not purely descriptive. When you call something a polyarchy, you are saying it is good in various ways. You're not just saying stuff about it. Yet the obligations, the, the, the restrictions to live up to a polyarchy are not so heavy as the ones imposed by the deliberative Democrats. Many deliberative Democrats would look at a polyarchy and say, well, it's, it's pretty good, but it's not real democracy. Daw thinks this is a much more reasonable version of real democracy, and it's the version of real democracy that a lot of people are going to have in the back of their heads. So, as I said, it's in the middle, probably a little bit closer to deliberative democracy, at least in its idealized form. It's characteristic of modern large-scale industrial democracy. Um, and it's still an ideal. Uh, no nation state completely lives up to the requirements of polyarchy. But importantly, it has six institutional features. Dallas focused primarily on the form of democracy, not its outcomes or anything else about it. So it's got the minimalist things. Elected officials, free, fair, and frequent elections. Pretty much the, the minimum for anyone to consider it a proper democracy. It allows freedom of expression which is something the minimalists don't necessarily think is part of the definition. Um, Dahl thinks it needs to be, for the obvious reason, that he th that it is a good support to the elections remaining free and fair. Uh, and as a corollary, and one that doesn't show up on as many lists, but is possibly important, is that there be alternative sources of information. This is the, um, what does freedom of expression mean if one person can go on CNN and the other person is shouting from a street corner kind of problem. So Dahl thinks a proper polyarchy needs to have a robust market for media. There need to be lots of different kinds of sources that people can look at um, to get their information. So certainly not only one state run media, but also situations where you have um, serious dominance by a small number of market actors are problematic. Uh, 
Dahl doesn't really get into, but one thing we might want to talk about is, can this go too far, right? There, you end up with problems like the, um, the argument that the internet now, by providing so many sources of information, actually ends up being sort of like an echo chamber. You know, back in the olden times of black and white TV, when everyone in America watched the nightly news on NBC, right? People had different opinions, but they at least were, had some commonality in the information that was being presented to them. But nowadays, if I if I want to, I can wake up and get you know all of my news from communists on Twitter. And y'all can wake up and get all of your news from, you know, Rush Limbaugh and, uh, you know, redstate.org and whatever, you know, whatever else. And we might not even have the same kind of informational landscape to draw on. Um, not just that we're getting biased news, but also, for instance, um, you know, all sorts of falsehoods can thrive in such, a, such an environment. Because if you know, if Dennis Kucinich says something completely false, uh, Al Franken's not going to call him on it most of the time. If Rush Limbaugh says something completely false, Sean Hannity's not going to call him on it most of the time. So um, you end up having the sort of degraded possibility of information. Um, okay, need associational autonomy. This is basically freedom of association. The idea is that in order to have a properly robust democracy, um, people need to be able to join into groups. Uh, this is not about the government particularly, but it's a way of influencing the government. If people are atomized, if people can't join into groups, it's they have limited ability to find common interests, to organize their political lives, um, and they're subject to capture by the organs of the state. Right. So what Dahl would be really worried about is a kind of situation where all organizations are part of the party. Right, where there's essentially state capture of all of civil society. Um, and inclusive citizenship. Everyone who is more or less a permanent resident of the society should be given full citizenship rights. So certainly some people, tourists, ambassadors, folks who have a short-term thing are, are out. Um, and there may be some gray area cases like um, people who have immigrated to your country illegally um, or in violation of immigration law, what do you do about them? Do they count? Do they not count? But the general idea is that anyone who is subject in a stable way to the laws of the society needs to be given full rights. And again, the reason is you need to have some kind of say in the in the the organization that that uh, is in control. Um, okay, so. If you have all of these things, Dahl thinks you'll have a fairly well-functioning democracy. One thing is not on the list, but, but bear special mention because Dahl is a big proponent of this, and it goes to the elite issue, is he does think that one thing that needs to be protected through institutional means is what he calls, some, some in some places, final control of the agenda. And the reason for this is that in Dahl's vision, and this is what makes him a lot closer to the deliberative Democrats than to the, um, the minimalists, is that democracy is not just about people choosing from a menu of options that is pr provided for them. Democracy is fundamentally about people getting to put their own society together. And so it can't be that there is some group that is insulated from popular control that gets to decide what the options are. The people, in some sense, there needs to be some institutional backing for a broader segment of folks having say on what options will be provided. Okay. So, what makes democracy good? For Dahl and for a lot of the defenders of democracy, fundamentally, it's about what we're comparing it to. There's the famous uh, Winston Churchill quote that democracy is the worst form of government except for all of the others. Uh, if you want to be a real classicist, um, Aristotle argued that uh, you know there were there were three forms of government: rule by the one, rule by the few, and rule by the many. Um, and well, if things were going perfectly, rule by the few was the best. It was this good compromise between having the elites who knew stuff in charge, but not having only one guy who can go crazy. Um, but if things are going to go wrong, and let's face it, 
things usually go wrong, then rule by the many is the least bad of the systems that are going wrong. Um, so there's a long tradition of basically defending democracy by reference to the alternatives. Um, and there are really two big alternatives uh, out there in the theory. One is anarchism, just having no authoritative government, nobody in charge, nobody who can make definitive rules. Dahl, like most political theorists we're going to look at, frankly kind of dismisses this. Um, the reason is basically Hobbesian. Uh, he basically thinks this could never work. That if you got rid of the government, you would not have a situation where everybody ruled themselves. You would have a situation where the people who were not as nice as everybody else, you know, most, Dahl, I think, thinks that even without a government, most people would most of the time do the right thing. I guess he's more Lockean in that way. Locke famously, unlike Hobbes, thought there were rules that governed you even before there was a government. It's just that, you know, people didn't always follow them. And that's Dahl's big worry about anarchism as well, is that bandits, warlords, people who don't care as much about other people would rise up and there would be no authoritative source of power that could smack them down. There are many anarchist responses to this kind of concern. I'm happy to talk about them, but I don't want to delay you too long with them here. Especially since the bigger concern for Dahl and for most other theorists of democracy is some form of what Dahl calls guardianship, or what we might think of as authoritarian um, regimes. So anything from monarchies to one-party rule like in Uganda to um, most people would analyze, uh, most people, most democratic theorists would put China currently into this kind of role. Systems where a individual or a restricted group of people are given power over the whole society because the idea is that they will govern better than throwing it open to the masses. Um, and there are reasons to think that this might be good. Um, there's a kind of elitist reason to think this might be good. There's lots of research. Uh, Brian Kaplan, who's an economist at George Mason, has written a lot on this about the kinds of bad decisions that large masses of people are prone to. You know, short-term thinking, getting stuff wrong, economic illiteracy, these kinds of things. Um, in a lot of countries, especially for you development folks, one of the arguments is that democracy is too divisive. That if you put a democracy in, um, people will vote with their tribe or their clan or their family or their linguistic group or whatever, and you'll basically create more fights by the very divisive kind of contest that democracy envisions, um, especially in the kind of minimalist versions. Uh, whereas if you have an agreed upon legitimate set of guardians, you'll avoid that. But there are two real big drawbacks to guardianship. Dahl thinks these are definitive, even if you like some kind of guardianship. Um, you probably need to deal with why you think these are not as big a problem as Dahl thinks they are. The first is the motivational problem. The Guardians have a lot of incentives to look out for the Guardians, and less incentives to look out for you poor non-Guardian people. Um, remember, this is a problem that Plato tried to deal with with the myth of the metals, right? He has to deal with it by adding another lie, where he says, whoa, Guardians, you have gold in your soul. Don't go try to get real physical gold. It'll impurify you, right? He's worried about the fact that the obvious thing for a guardian to do is say, look at all this power. Let me use it for me. Even if the guardian is not wholly venal, it's real easy to, you know, lie to yourself. Power corrupts. So it's real easy to tell yourself you're doing what's good for everybody when you're really doing what's good for you. And this segues to the epistemological problem, the problem of knowledge, which is that even if we assume that the Guardians are perfectly sincere and altruistic. They only want what's best for everyone. They may not know what's best for everyone. Especially if the Guardians are drawn from an elite, they might have, might have the right perspective. They might do things that um, you think, that they think are good for you, but that you would disagree, and that may not actually be good for you. They may make mistakes because they don't have perspective. Um, they may make mistakes because, as we mentioned in class, they can't properly empathize um, with you, even if they're being totally sincere, they really want to help. Basically, they may end up being paternalistic in the bad sense of things, even if they're utterly sincere. 
most of the, I won't run through Dahl's whole list of benefits, but most of the other benefits that he sees from democracy flow from these kinds of considerations, flow from the advantage that democracy has over something like guardianship. So that's why it avoids tyranny, because you don't allow tyrants to rise, if you, especially if you have the polyarchal institutional controls. Um, it's really friendly to the market. Um, it's friendly, you know, democracy in the polyarchical sense is friendly to a system where we let people pretty much buy and sell what they want instead of trying to tell them what's good for them, um, these sorts of things. We'll talk a little while from now about whether markets are really good or sort of good or not good at all, but Dahl at least thinks, you know, there's been this very powerful alliance for prosperity between democracies and markets, and um, they seem to, in general, not be stable without the other. Again, China being the big outlier, and folks like Dahl typically argue that, well, you know, this is a historical anomaly. Either China's going to end up clamping down on its market or opening up its political system. It can't be stable otherwise. Okay, so this brings us to the question of, even if we buy in general that democracy is good for the people who have democracy, um, is it actually good for everyone? This is possibly less relevant to some of the folks like the liberal theorists we're going to look at, but certainly relevant to folks engaged in development, um, folks engaged in certain kinds of security. Uh, you know, anyone who's looking at this from an international perspective. And Dahl, you know, is upfront about this. He thinks democracy is good for everyone who has democracy, but it is not going to work everywhere. Uh, there are a few important things that democracy seems to need in order to be stable that are not universally possessed. And sometimes, Dahl will argue, there's some dispute about this, need to be put in place in through non-democratic means before um, you can actually build a democracy there. So, uh, civilian control of security, basically what we have in the US, you, the military doesn't get to decide things. Now, here, a different outlier is Turkey. There's imperfect, at least, civilian control of the military in Turkey, and yet it is often held up as, you know, not perfect, but a fairly strong democratic system. You need to have people believe in democracy. Uh, if people don't buy that democracy is good, they won't keep it. Um, they will fight against it, they will look for undemocratic rulers and that sort of thing. Um, an obvious one, possibly from a theoretical perspective, but one that gets left out sometimes, is no strong foreign anti-democratic interference. Uh, it is obviously very difficult for a country to have a democracy if you have an outside force that is bolstering the anti-democratic forces. Uh, if you look historically, you can find examples of this problem from across the right-left political spectrum, whether it's, you know, the U.S. helping crack down, U.S. and Britain helping crack down on protests in Bahrain at the moment, or Russia supporting the Syrian regime. Um, yeah, if you're Syrian rebels, it's hard to fight Russian support. Dahl thinks that there needs to be a market economy, the same way that uh, historically markets have not been stable without democracy. Dahl thinks that democracy you know, certainly it's true that historically democracy has gone hand in hand with market economies, um, but Dahl thinks this is not just accidental, it's they need to go together. Um, and reasonable wealth. If people are poor enough, they're not going to care enough about their democratic system to preserve it, um, is at least the, the argument. Uh, they will be easily captured by individuals who promise to help them out of their dire economic circumstances at the expense of dem democracy. And then this fancy thing that we'll come back to in some way later that Dahl calls weak subcultural pluralism. And what this means is that people have identities that are not just congruent with their national identity, but that these identities are not extremely strong. So the model, he so he's thinking of a situation like the United States where people identify as Jewish or Catholic <clears throat> or African American or Asian American or Latino or whatever, but their identity, their subcultural identity is typically not stronger than their American identity. If you ask most Americans, the idea is, you know, um, what is important to you, what kinds of identity are important to you, they will say, well, you know, I'm an American first and then a Latino. 
basically is the is the rough idea is that if you don't have that your democracy becomes unstable and this goes back to the sort of joint project model that a lot of the folks influenced by deliberative democracy have where if I think of myself as first Jewish and second American when other non-Jewish Americans disagree with me I'm gonna be very very tempted to say you know what forget those guys let me get together with all my other Jewish American friends and we'll do our own thing I won't feel bad about marginalizing them. I won't feel a need to include them. But if I think of myself as first American, I will feel a need to in, to include people even who have other identities with which I, I disagree or with which I clash. Um, at the same time, you might say, well, why just not have any subcultural identities? This is tied to the importance of association. Dahl thinks that people need other sources of meaning in their lives, other sources of identity, I love democratic theorists think this, otherwise you end up with capture by the party or tyranny of the majority. You end up with the people who buy into the dominant paradigm, you know, inevitably there will be people who don't fit the dominant identity all that well and they will be in danger of being crushed or marginalized or driven out or this sort of thing. Um, you even see this in some ways in Europe, where, well, Europe, European societies have a reputation for being sort of very much more laid back and sort of communal than, um, than say, American society. You also see f occasionally fairly ugly flare-ups of xenophobia, headscarf bands, mosque bands, uh, this sort of thing, um, that I think Dahl would point to and say, this is a this is a problem about subcultural pluralism. There's not enough of it to allow the society to be open to new kinds of people coming in. Um, and finally, democracy itself can be destabilizing. Uh, there is this thing called the democratic peace hypothesis. Uh, it originates, I believe, with Kant, the idea that uh, democracies don't go to war with each other. There is, uh, to a first approximation, it seems historically to be correct that democracies do not go to war with each other. But democratizing countries seem to go to war a lot. Um, civil conflict theorists especially have looked at, they go to war both with their neighbors and internally a lot. Um, in a lot of civil conflict models, for instance, what uh, Fearon calls anocracy. So being not authoritarian, but not quite a full democracy in the sort of polyarchical sense, um, is a major risk factor for having a civil conflict. And also any change in your level of political liberalism, whether you're getting more democratic or less democratic, um, the very upheaval associated with that change seems to be associated with a higher risk of conflict. So even if it is absolutely true that democracy is great for everyone and everyone should have it, it may be problematic to try to turn countries into democracies. Maybe the kind of thing that needs to be handled with care at the very least. Okay, so to sum up, um, there's a range of understandings of democracy beyond the sort of basic idea that it's ruled by the people, and the devil is often in the details about what you mean when you say democracy. Um, for most people, it means more than just majority rule, but the more is, you know, in, in dispute. Um, the benefits for democracy that are claimed for typically are one or both of two things. On the one hand, people will claim that people under democracies are freer. They have more options. Uh, if minimalists especially focus on the options, maximalists and their allies especially focus on the ability to control your society and have freedom that way. Um, you know, to have the rules imposed on you not be necessarily light, but be self-chosen. Um, and also responsibility. Uh, again, minimalists tend to be more excited about kinds of responsibility where you know everybody lives their own life without a paternalistic guardian. Maximalists are more excited about the kinds of responsibility that comes with participation in the system. Right? People take responsibility for participation, for being a good citizen, for getting involved in politics, uh, not just for their own lives, but for the lives of everyone. And unfortunately, for all of its many and manifold virtues, democracy may not actually be appropriate for all situations. Um, I'm being a little bit facetious, but even if you buy that it's good, 
it may not always be appropriate. And even if it is appropriate, in some sense, it may be very difficult to implement and or make sustainable, especially and dangerously if you're thinking about this from the perspective of an outside actor who's going to try to create democracy somewhere, which historically democracies and markets are associated. Historically, you know, democracies don't go to war with each other. Historically, imposing democracy, really, really hard.